<clears throat> Welcome. Uh, I'm Wynne Arias at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and I welcome you to the 12th session of the 21st year of a course called Demystifying Medicine. Its goal is to bridge the exciting developments in biology and engineering with medicine and in many other areas uh, that touch broadly uh, on health. Uh, for those who uh, are joining us, perhaps for the very first time, this slide presents some valuable information for you. The sessions are on Tuesdays from 4 to 6 Eastern Standard Time from January 4th to May 3rd. Here they can be accessed, as you have done, through the videocast.nih.gov link. The entire course schedule is present on the link indicated on the next line. And those who attend, please go back a slide. Those who attend at least 50% of the sessions, that's about 10, and pass a not complicated computerized final exam can receive a certificate. For physicians who seek CME credit, the code for today is listed on the slide. The number is 38650. Now we encourage you to submit questions during the presentations, and that can easily be done by using the send live feedback on the video cast display on your laptop. Please note that all previous sessions back for 21 years are archived on the NIH video cast past events and the link is provided on the slide. Any additional information, please get in touch with me. The next slide, please. Now the logo for this course is the Brooklyn Bridge which we have shown at the beginning of every course over the past 21 years. And the intent of it is to illustrate the fact that people get together by virtue of building bridges and they communicate, such as the two individuals on the catwalk on the left. And all of the sessions in our course are intended to be communications. Uh, these are not yesterday's research seminars. They are intended to stimulate, to provoke your interest and your concerns about major health and major scientific uh, problems. Now, today's bridge has a unique feature connected to it. It is the bridge between, next slide, the major public health problem of drug abuse and addiction. Uh, it's referred to as an epidemic, but I think it could also warrant the term pandemic. And it's interesting, prior to the COVID pandemic, it seemed as if drug abuse and addiction issues were at the top of the news. And whether it be OxyContin, methamphetamine, or fentanyl, there was major daily that, that I wear very families, communities that were affected uh, by these drugs and concern about how did it happen and what are the underlying mechanisms from the standpoint of social environment and also basic biological science and, of course, how to treat and prevent. Now that the COVID pandemic appears to be subsiding, the issue of this other epidemic or pandemic is increasingly coming back to the fore. And furthermore, there's an additional feature. Over the past, I'm not sure how many years, marijuana became freely available and was no longer restricted as it had been before. What are the consequences of these two areas, major areas, challenges in the drug abuse and addiction world. 
And the questions that have arisen have perhaps been highlighted by what is the risk of addiction and long-term effects in children, in adolescents? What do we know about how the brain develops and responds to these drugs? Are there age-dependent specific drug effects? And if so, what are the medical and public health consequences of such uh, an event? Now, this is the topic of today's bridging. And we also have the bridging into what one might call the brave new world. And that is the world where computational psychiatry and digital phenotypes are being used in an effort to predict substance abuse, addiction, through the use of these technology tools. So these two areas will be discussed today uh, by our speakers, who are extraordinary individuals and highly accomplished in their fields. Now, the next slide, the first speaker will be Nora Volkoff, who is well known to us. Uh, Nora is director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is noted to be the largest funder of research on health aspects of drug abuse and addiction in the world. She will discuss the adolescent brain and its unique risks with respect to addiction from the standpoint of science and public policy. Now, Nora is an extraordinary individual. She graduated in medicine from the National University in Mexico in psychiatry at New York University, and for many years was the nuclear medicine director of the medical department and life science uh, center at the Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. And since 2003, has been a highly productive director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Nora pioneered the application of brain imaging to understand how substance abuse occurs, particularly through the dopamine system. In effect, making drug abuse a neuro brain, neurological brain disease. She's also studied the neurobiology of obesity, ADHD, aging, and through all of this has had a major, truly leadership role in the national response to various addictions, including the OxyContin. In recognition of her extraordinary status, she's been recipient of innumerable national and international awards, including election to the National Academy of Sciences. Nora is widely recognized by the entire USA and probably world public and by the United States Congress, mainly for her work on addiction and presenting the facts for all to observe. Along the way, she's received a series of awards and recognitions. For example, being called one of the top 100 people who shape our world one of the 100 most powerful women, an innovator of the year, and many others. We are deeply grateful to you, Nora, for taking the time to participate once again in demystifying medicine and educating us. And her topic will be the adolescent brain and addiction risk. Now, our second speaker is a new member of the NIH faculty, Brenda Curtis. Uh, Brenda received a master's in public health from the University of Illinois and a PhD from the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where she was also an assistant professor of psychiatry and addiction. In 2022, just this year, she was recruited to NIDA as a tenure track investigator within the clinical pharmacology and therapeutics branch 
and as a principal investigator of a new technology and translational research unit. Now, Dr. Curtis has an extraordinary background for bridging computational psychiatry, digital phenotyping of individuals who use drugs and truly intersecting addiction treatment, psychiatry of the computational nature and innovative technologies. This is an area that is truly translational and seeks to leverage social media and big data methodology to create and evaluate technology tools regarding substance abuse and related conditions. And also she's interested in studying how social stigma play a, a fundamental role in the health inequities. Now this is a brave new world, which had images of being of individuals who perhaps are at risk uh, for drug abuse, uh, using personalized, even smartphone connections to anticipate what it is that influences the course of their disease, their relapses, their recovery, and other areas of important behavioral and social events that are critical in the development of drug abuse. So we're deeply grateful to Brenda and truly welcome her uh, to the NIH faculty. So now we will begin. But before we do, I am reminded that today is International Women's Day. And so I wish to bestow these roses upon our two speakers. Unfortunately, it's virtual, maybe another time in life. Thank you. Nora? Yeah. Oh, yes, no, wonderful. I love the roses and virtual roses actually are almost as good as real roses. It's the, the, the symbol that counts. And remembering that it's International Women's Science Day is, is quite, uh, quite important. So thanks for reminding us all of that. And, and Wynne, thanks very much for having me here. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege for me to be able to come back to the demystifying uh, uh, session and uh, particularly to be speaking along my colleague, Dr. Brenda Curtis, who um, is part of our NIDA intramural program and who has basically embodies the concept of innovation and uh, opportunities that we have as technology advances or shifting the way that we address problems that are, um, are crucial for us as individuals and our society. My presentation today, I wanted to highlight the notion of uh, the, the developing brain, childhood and adolescence, because that is at the essence where many of the issues that are going to um, relate to vulnerability for substance use disorder, for mental illness, for many health conditions emerge. And it's also by targeting our understanding of these- Excuse of me, Dr. Bokal, can you please show your slides? We don't see your yes, slides. I haven't seen my slides yet, but I will in the meantime. Oh, okay. So if you want to see me okay. with the slides, I can put them Oh, no, 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 no. We were just making very sure. Very obedient. So I was just sort of commenting that this is uh, obviously, um, it is a time where uh, childhood and adolescence, a period where we build both resilience and vulnerability. So understanding those processes and the specifics of it provide us with means to actually uh, buffer them if, uh, if there are abnormalities in those trajectories. But I'm going to be focusing it uh, specifically from the understanding of substance use disorders and factors that makes us vulnerable. Because after all, as um, Dr. Arias was discussing, we are amidst an, uh, an epidemic of overdose deaths that our country has been fighting for at least two decades and which have not been able to control at all. If anything, we have seen that over that during the COVID pandemic, the two year period, there has been an overall average close to 30% increase in people that are dying from overdoses, which in a way is not totally unexpected due to the fact that one of the factors that contribute to drug taking and uh, and compulsive use and uh, emergence of uh, dangerous behaviors is situations of stress. 
And I think that we can qualify the, this period of the COVID, COVID pandemic and one of the most stressful. And also as an, as an agency, the NIH, we have obviously the obligation to study the consequences of these stressors in the well-being of individuals, and certainly the consequences in the development of children and adolescents and their subsequent risk for substance use disorder and other mental illnesses. Um, I have nothing to disclose. And the, at the conclusion of this lecture, participants should be able to describe some of the factors that impact brain development, human brain development. So because I want to target uh, the importance of this developmental stage in our lives to substance use and addiction, I want to highlight only one aspect of the multitude of factors and negative consequences of, of drug use and substance use disorders in our country. And I'm highlighting it with the uh, overdose epidemic because it's probably the most dramatic emergence of an event that has caused so much suffering in a relatively short period of time. The overdose epidemic uh, started really at the late 90s, early uh, 2000. And it emerged by the overprescription of opioid medications by, by the healthcare system, with the intentions, at least, uh, of treating people that were on pain, but becoming very complacent in those practices, leading to the prescription of much higher doses that needed, and to patients that did not fit the criteria for the use of, of, of an opioid medication. And overconfident in the sense that we already knew in the 90s very clearly that and in the 80s that opioids carried a high risk of overdose associated with their um, binding to the mu opioid receptors in the respiratory centers of the brain, we're inhibiting that. So we recognize that we needed to be very careful when we prescribed opioid medications to patients, particularly when we're using high doses because that could increase the risk of dying from respiratory failure. At the same time, we also knew also for many, many years that opioids are very rewarding and highly addictive. So to the extent that you were exposing people to opioids when they really didn't need them or for longer periods of time or higher doses, you were increasing the risk of becoming addicted. And then in and of itself, addiction to opioids is one of the most severe. That's how the overdose star crisis started. Over prescription of medications that actually led to ultimately um, the, the, this, this red line here, white people dying from overdoses. And what was interesting about it is that it was white people which were more likely to be prescribed opioids and that led to a higher rate of increases in mortality in white people compared with black people in blue. And but that then started to change around, we would say 2016, when the nature of the drugs that were basically being purchased in the illicit market changed. As the government agencies became aware that we had a problem of overdoses linked with prescription opioids, new guidelines in emerge and more strict regulation of how to prescribe these medications led to a reduction in the numbers of pills that were prescribed uh, while at the same time, in one decade ago, we saw a research, uh, an increase in the use of heroin that continued to contribute to overdose deaths, even though prescription opioids medications were going down. But the main uh, game changer came in 2016, when the reintroduction of synthetic opioids, particularly of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Fentanyl uh, was developed as a medicine to be used for very, very severe pain uh, for, uh, for enhancing anesthesia that has a potency that's estimated to be 100 times higher than morphine or 50 times higher than heroin. That actually is synthesized, the synthesis of uh, fentanyl is a synthetic drug, is relatively easy. And as a result of that, it becomes a very appealing drug for the drug dealers because it's much more profitable than selling heroin and much easier to bring across borders. So we have rapidly seen since 2016, the market of illicit substances being taken over by fentanyl and the overdose death driven initially by prescription opioids then by heroin, now in, most, in many places predominantly by uh, fentanyl. 
Then with the COVID pandemic, uh, this resulted actually also in another shift that had already started to emerge, which was the increased presence of methamphetamine across different states in the United States. And the combination of the increases in fentanyl overdoses and the increases in doses in deaths from methamphetamine, half of which were linked with combination of uh, with fentanyl, resulted in the massive increase that we have of overdose deaths. In fact, in June of 2020, for the first time, we reached a horrible milestone, milestone of more than 100,000 deaths over a one year period or just from overdose deaths alone, a number we had never seen before. And that again is accounted by the increase of fentanyl availability, accessibility alongside of methamphetamine, along with all of the challenges imposed by the COVID pandemic. So as we look ourselves and says, what, what should we do as a nation? I would say that at the beginning when we have the opioid crisis driven by prescription medication, it was a much clearer path. We needed to provide much better regulation of access to opioid medications to those that needed them, while recognizing that we needed to accelerate development of better treatments for patients suffering from severe pain. As we encounter ourselves at the crossroad of 2022, with overdose deaths driven by these extremely potent illicit synthetic substances. And the fact that the drugs in that are in the illicit market are more and more derived from synthetic compounds that are very, very potent. And that it's not necessarily patients that emerge from pain conditions going into these drugs for the use of these drugs from the beginning. And also recognizing that many of these drugs are not associated per se with addiction for people experimenting with drugs that did not know contain fentanyl and therefore when they unsuspectedly consume them overdose and dying. And those considerations of the multiple layers that have been added to the overdose crisis are necessary to actually address the current over the overdose epidemic that we face. And that is what brings me to childhood and adolescence. Why? Because that's where we start to see the factors that will lead someone to want to experiment with drugs. And if they experiment with drugs to escalate, and if they escalate to become addicted. We know that addiction is a disease of the brain, even though this concept has generated an enormous amount of controversy, because it is criticized and says that's ignores the important and crucial factor that social, economic, uh, and uh, and availability issues play in the process of addiction. And it's absolutely correct. Yes, addiction is a disease that produces changes in the brain that account for the escalation of the drug taking, the compulsive use of the drug, the inability to stop using it despite its negative consequences. Those relate to very specific changes in the function of brain circuits. And we've basically been able to map many of those. But it is clear that the environment actually determines and plays a key role what to determine whether exposure to a drug will lead to addiction or not. You can have all of the genetic factors which have been known to contribute at least 50% of your risk to addiction. But if you do not have an environment that is actually adverse, but instead have an environment that protects you, or you're in an environment where there are no drugs, you will never become addicted. And those are one of the areas of most interest scientifically is to understand how those environmental factors that we know increase the vulnerability for drug taking, as well as environmental factors that create resilience, interact with our genes, or otherwise, let's say, how do our genes influence the way that we respond to an environment? Also, in biology, it's not just genes. We need to recognize, and this is clearly the case with addiction, that the exposure to drugs uh, and the vulnerability that you have if you get exposed to drugs to become addicted is different at different stage of your brain development, being highest if you get exposed earlier in adolescence than later on. So understanding how that developmental stage, genes, environment ultimately interact with the drug to affect mechanisms to produce addiction is, again, one of the key areas of research. <clears throat> 
And that same area of research is crucial to help us delineate targeted interventions that can prevent that transition. First environment, how do we do an intervention that you protect you to go this way? Well, we know, what do we know about um, brain development? We know that it's of course very important. We know that in the human brain, it's a very protracted process that starts in fetal development and proceeds up to your middle twenties. And the brain keeps changing uh, even after 20, but the, the speed at which it changes is much greater during the first two decades of life. And it is the way that it's intended to be because the brain is a complex network of networks that is not fully formed, very different from the liver or the stomach. The brain to be fully formed needs to be exposed to the environment where that individual is going to be residing so that it can actually optimize its architecture to be better able to process and succeed in that environment. And that's why the protracted nature of the brain and also the neuroplasticity of the brain. In other words, the brain is modified physically, the synaptic connections may be strengthened or weakened depending on the type of environment that you get exposed. Now, this of course is influenced too by your genetics. And so your genes are going to uh, create certain constraints of what areas are going to be developing and how you're going to be responding to the environmental influences. Studies of heritability actually now for many years have started to delineate and separate apart what is the influence of genes versus environment on brain development. So what you see here is the changes in the brain development for cortical th thickness from a five years of age, eight, 11, 14, and 17. And you can see that as we grow from being very young to uh, later in adolescence, there's actually a decrease in the uh, cortical thickness that is driven in part by heritability. And we just, you separate what are genetic versus environmental components, something fascinating emerges. First of all, we see that the environmental effects are most profound in this case, the higher the variance, the higher the influence. The, the environmental effects are much more profound at age five, eight, and 11. And while they're still significant at 14 and 17, they are much less so. In contrast, if you look at the effects of genetics, you can see that yes, perhaps there is a stronger influence also during the early, early ages of childhood but the difference with later on is much less so than what you see with the environment. And what that means is that environmental exposures during these very early years of childhood are likely to have a much greater consequence as it relates to how the brain will get ultimately formed than if you were exposed to this environment later in adolescence. And also it brings forth the notion that your genetics are not necessarily predestination because through these environmental influences, you can influence ultimately in ways that would be very positive, the development of the brain. So this therefore has implications and it does highlight how crucial childhood is at a period of time when the environment can act either to favor you or to actually put you at a tremendous disadvantage. The other thing that we have learned is not just that, the, core, that the, the brain actually prunes itself in certain areas, decreasing cortical thickness and enlarging others in white matter tracts so that the brain becomes more and more and more connected as you grow older. But the, the formations of those connections and the functionality of the different regions of the brain occurs at different times, it is space. When you are born as a baby, you need to be able to fear, uh, feel hunger. You need to be able to feel warm. You need to be able to start seeing. And so the somatosensory cortex develops much faster. And so does the limbic regions. You need to be able to feel uncomfortable when you are hungry and cry. Um, then areas of the brain that are necessary for, for abstraction and um, self-revelation. So your brain uh, limbic regions are fully developed much earlier than your cortical regions of the brain, such as the prefrontal areas that are necessary for executive action. And this explains why 
the brain of a child or an adolescent behaves differently from one of an adult. Why an adolescent is much more likely to be impulsive and take risks than an adult would not? Because the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, whereas the limbic areas of the brain are actually generating very intense reactions. And this is where adolescents, if placed in an environment with access to drugs, may actually be at greater risk of in engaging in risky behaviors, including drug taking, but not just limited to drug taking. And, and in, in, in discussions about sad dots, ultimately what we have known even before we started to delineate what genetic and what is environmental, what one of the most solid areas of research from epidemiological studies have been the recognition effectively that adverse environmental exposures increase the risk of people to, um, to take drugs and if they take drugs to become addicted to them. And uh, this is an old study that identified actually a cumulative effect of adverse childhood uh, uh, events as it relates to increasing the risk for a substance use disorder. And it shows that the more the adverse childhood environment, uh, adverse event, the higher the numbers, these accumulative effects, the greater their, your risk, increasing uh, to a tenfold higher risk of a substance use disorder if you have these exposures during childhood. What are they? Emotional, physical, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, physical neglect, household dysfunction, better mother, parental separation or divorce, mental illness in household, household substance misuse, incarcerated household members. We've known all along that these factors are ones that contribute to increasing the risk of individuals with a substance use disorder. What have we known in terms of the neurobiology? So yes, we recognize them, but why, why is that so? Well, uh, using brain imaging, investigators have been actually trying to understand how do the brain of children that are in neglected environment without stimulation, without emotional support, differ from the brain of children that do not have those adverse conditions? And in this respect, the use of magnetic resonance imaging, and it allows you to do use different tools to investigate different questions, has been extraordinarily valuable. And this is a study that exemplifies how uh, its impact. This, uh, in this study, they use diffusion tensor imaging, which enables you to look at the connectivity, the structural connectivity between regions of the brain. And as I say, as your brain develops, that connectivity actually expands and is one of the whole hallmarks of brain development. And the, the investigator tested and compared the brain of children who had been raised in an orphanage with those of children who had been raised in a family environment. And they showed, not surprisingly, that children brought up in an orphanage had significant decrease in fibers that were connecting. These were the fibers identified here, uh, different areas of the brain. Very notable, the uncinate, uncinate fasciculus, which is a connection that links the limbic brain with cortical areas. Of course, extremely important for self-regulation. And in this study, which was published in 2010, they also show that the longer the period that these children have been in an orphanage, the actually the less the, the fibers were developed. Documenting like others have done since then, that deprivation is one of the most negative factors as it relates to adversely influencing the human brain development. The human brain needs to be challenged and needs to be encounters environments that actually enable its further formation. So pro not providing those environments actually interferes with this development. So we knew from those studies, there are many others, but the, but the issue with these studies is that they tend to be a small in samples. And as a result of that, they, it's, it's actually hard to pinpoint exactly what is determining uh, these changes. Recognizing this, we actually launched two of the largest and boldest projects that we have ever done at NIDA to try to develop a database that would allow us to understand specifically how do adverse environments influence the human brain um, in, its, in, in all of its diversity? And how do genetic factors in turn 
affect those environmental exposures. We launched two big studies, the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, or it goes by the acronyms ABCD, that recruited in 2015 11,880 children that we have been following starting from age nine to 10 and periodically doing a, a brain imaging every two, ye two years while uh, studying them on a yearly basis for assessing their cognitive development, their social, their behavior, their health, their poverty, a highly, highly phenotyped cohort. And last year, we initiated an equivalent study of 7,500 infants, which was initiated in September of last year, following a two-year pilot project that enabled us to identify the network, the states, the universities across the United States that it, it will be able to recruit and retain and study these infants. This is a, these two studies are done with the participation of multiple institutes at the NIH, including the Alcohol Institute, the National Institute of Mental Health, and Child Development Study also uh, supported in part to heal funds. So these studies have given us a much in great, greater depth understanding about the human brain and the social and environmental factors that are influencing that. And let me highlight an example, because I think that this is, again, something that, uh, that shines light into many of the struggles that we're facing in a society as it relates with the COVID, making us recognize the horrible health disparities that we have in our country in the 21st century. Unfortunately, those health disparities that accounted for a much greater number of people from underrepresented groups dying from COVID are not just limited to adults, and they emerge very early in childhood and adolescence. This is uh, perhaps uh, one of the first studies uh, based on the ABCD that showed how these environmental influences affects the development of the brain. In this case, uh, the investigators were interested in understanding how lead exposure affected cognition and brain structures, and how those, the exposure to lead was in turn modulated by your income, by socioeconomics. So they divided the children into those that came from high income families, middle income families, and low income families. And they assessed the effects of different levels of lead exposure on cognition. And you can see clearly the inverse association between cognition and lead exposure that is clear and present and significant for individuals with low income, but not so much at all in middle income. And is not, uh, you cannot see that effect on cognition of lead exposure in individuals that come from families of high income. And the effects of lead can be seen in terms of the cortical surface area or the cortical volumes. The negative effects of lead are associated with reduced volume growth only in those children that were born from low income families. Whereas you can see in the high income families is providing them protection against the adverse effects of lead exposure on brain development on cognition. This is a subsequent study where we were interested in understanding of all of the socioeconomic factors that have been associated with a uh, higher risk for substance use disorder and poorer outcomes, which were the ones that were most important in defining the phenotype, and the phenotype being cortical volume, cortical thickness, and cognition. And what we showed usable, using multiple regression modeling is that the number one factor that determined the differences in the, in the development of the brain resulting in smaller volumes for most brain regions and thinner cortices of all of the socioeconomic uh, factors, low income is the variable that accounted for most of the variance. And similarly, uh, it was the family income that actually determined that higher, what was responsible for accounting for the higher amount of variance in cognitive performance, indicating again, that there is a factor, socioeconomics, that influences enormously the development of the brain. And it is a relevant factor in many ways, not just because of its impact, which is actually quite large, but it's because to me, it is a tractable factor. 
we can address and understand what is it in a low income family that is driving these discrepancies. And there are multiple consequences of being brought up in a low income family, including having access to poor quality healthcare, not having access of good education, living environments that are very, very noisy, in environments that there, where there may be violence, where there's not sufficient high quality food. So all of those factors, which are in compounds on low income are, are, are ones that can be tractable in prevention efforts. So that's what the ABCD study had already been doing and it's continued to do. And it has actually given us an, an insight, uh, unprecedented insight on how impactful socioeconomic effects are on the development of children. But it also placed us in a unique position uh, to understand what were the consequences of the COVID pandemic. Why? Because the, start, the study started recruitment in 2015 and 2016. So we were in the middle of the ABCD study when COVID pandemic came into effect. And our teenagers, which were studying in environments that were basically surrounded by other, other, other teenagers, uh, and, and that peer interaction is crucial for their development and their learning had to shift under those conditions. And also in and of itself, the uncertainty of what was happening was also likely to have effects that were likely to vary as a function of the support systems of those families. So realizing this, we uh, put in, we reach out to the investigators of the ABCD and the HBCD, uh, asking for supplements that would allow them to uh, specifically address the consequences of the COVID pandemic in the well being of these children, and also the consequences of infections themselves on brain development. So, several papers have already been published out of those surveys that have been done with regards to the influence of factors that determine the risk of an adolescent to start taking drugs. So, these adolescents are now 13 to 14 years of age. They are at a stage in life where they are starting to experiment with drugs, still at a low level, but still is present. And based on these studies, we can see during the pandemic, which were the factors that determine in a positive way that is increasing the likelihood of uh, experiment with drugs versus those that decrease the likelihood of experimenting with drugs, which are the factors that have the largest influence in drug taking behavior at this early stage of adolescence. And the factors that emerge are not surprising, some that we recognize all along and can be divided in terms of ultimately the uh, mental health stressors. We know that depression and anxiety are some of the factors that leads teenagers to take drugs, perhaps to auto-medicate themselves. And no surprising here, you have them. Youths with had higher depression, high anxiety or greater perception of, st of stress were the ones that were more likely to take drugs. The family environment is also fundamental. And again, this has been emerging in independent studies all along. In families where parents take drugs, whether it's alcohol or cannabis, their children are much more likely to consume them too. And as it relates to specific factors that contributed to the pandemic in way in, in, in the due to the pandemic that contributed to increasing the risk was individuals that lost income during the pandemic in family incomes those children were much more likely to start using drugs. And, and also when there were, were, there were actually material hardships associated with the COVID pandemic. So yes, indeed, uh, the COVID pandemic recapitulates what we had already known from epidemiological studies, but it accelerated by amplifying the adverse effects of stress, uncertainty, and anxiety. This is another study that emerged from these uh, surveys that were done as part of the ABCD study. Again, highlighting how important the adverse childhood environmental, ex adverse childhood uh, exposures are on ultimately the outcome of these children. So this was the, uh, before the pandemic, this is during the pandemic, and uh, as a function of whether you have more, less or more adverse childhood experiences whether you will see an increase in the sadness, in the fear, in the or a decrease in positive mood depends not 
per se on not everyone is exposed to the COVID so a difference is in increasing sadness or fear or decreasing their, their positive mood. It was those children that had exposures to adverse childhood experiences in whom the COVID pandemic had the worst, uh, the worst effects. Again, again remember, reminding us of that cumulative uh, slide that I show how one event, you may be able to buffer it, two, uh, it becomes harder. And as you go more and more childhood ex negative experiences, it becomes therefore much harder to overcome and that results in pathology. And finally, this is another study that, uh, that uses the ABCD survey data to try to determine if they could predict which children, this is not, are going to start taking drugs or which children are going to have anxiety, depressive symptoms during COVID. The same factors that we've known all along, family conflicts, girls are more vulnerable to anxiety, sleep problems result in higher likelihood of anxiety and depression, pre-existing psychopathology, not having regular meals, and that's a simple intervention. So if you structure the life of an adolescent, that will decrease their the, the depression and anxiety. Excessive screen time was also associated with worse outcomes, feeling separated from a close family member. And those predictors of positive affect are social support, physical activities, and healthy sleep. And as you hear uh, in the next presentation of, uh, by Brenda Curtis, actually the new tools that we have for social support and interaction, we can start to recognize that these could be very, very valuable as interventions for preventions to ensure that, you know, that children and adolescents have the social support uh, systems that are necessary for their good outcomes. But that's the ABCD. The effects of social environments, as I mentioned at the uh, beginning of my talk, are initiated during fetal development. And many studies have been done in this arena. And there's actually studies recognizing what are uh, exposures that are negative, that occur during prenatal development, and what are the exposures during prenatal development that are protective. In the risk conferring prenatal exposures, we again see a cumulative effect. The more of these exposures you have, the worse you are. So that if you have one to zero versus cumulative exposures, uh, that actually, I guess, uh, over, overwhelms the ability to modulate and buffer adverse effects. Of those that are non-infections, because we know that infections agents can negatively influence the fetal brain, and including COVID, but not limited to COVID. We of course know of Zika, which was actually quite, it's quite harmful to brain development. And, and, and but there are, there are exposures that are not just infections that can have negative consequences are known all along. We know that early alcohol consumption, for example, is adversely affects brain development. We know that nicotine affects negatively affects brain development. We know that marijuana exposure during a pregnancy is also negatively affecting the, the fetal brain. Birth complications, pregnancy complications, all of them interfere negatively with the development of the brain. And then certainly there are several interventions that have been known to pro provide protection to mothers who are pregnant, including proper exercise, sleeping, diet, and mental well-being. So we had launched the HPCD two years before, uh, last September, to, as a pilot. And that allows to, again, just like with the ABCD, start to obtain information about how, what happened to these newborns um, that were born during the COVID pandemic, and how do they compare with the newborns that were born before the COVID pandemic. And these are non-published results um, uh, on a preprint by one of the investigators of the HPCD study which has been evaluated since 2010, cognitive development of children for each year, and, uh, and, and that, allowed, that allowed him to determine and to compare the cognitive development of children throughout all of these years uh, with the cognitive development of uh, a same age newborns um, that were born during the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is the average, this is the standard deviations, and you can clearly see the reduced cognitive performance of these uh, children that were born during the COVID pandemic. With brain imaging, he also has been able to document 
that there is a delayed maturation of myelination in these newborns that actually occur during the COVID pandemic as compared to newborns of the same age before the COVID pandemic. And this is what this sagittal image here to the left and the axial image shows here, the average areas where myelination has not been completed in this where the myelination differs is less in children born during the COVID pandemic. And what is notable about these brain images is these are not infants that where the mother got COVID during the pregnancy. The effects, these negative effects that you observe in brain development from um, the mother's pregnancy during COVID are likely to reflect the negative uh, effects of stress during pregnancy, which others, of course, have since documented just in different cohorts. As it relates ultimately about what is driving this decrease in cognitive learning, I suspect that again, uh, stress uh, imposed by COVID uh, is distracting the mothers and interfering with a relationship that is necessary for the brain to develop. So yes, we need to recognize that these are consequential to the brain development and that they will be influencing subsequent stages of these children as they grow into adolescents and adults and understanding how to intervene to actually reverse these changes uh, so that there are no negative effects to these uh, exposures becomes what should be one of our priorities. And with that, I want to end my presentation again with the overdose crisis because I started with the overdose crisis and I want to end with the overdose crisis. Having gone over childhood and adolescence and you know, during the uh, overdose crisis and the opioid epidemic, we haven't really been worried about teenagers because teenagers don't use heroin. And during these um, almost two decades and actually particularly in the past decades, we have had some of the lowest rates of heroin use ever since we've been monitoring them in 1975. Extremely, extremely low levels of heroin. Uh, over the past five years, we've seen also the lowest levels that are ever of opioid prescription misuse, which were at one point at 10% among 12th graders. And now they are like at 1%. So there would be a dramatic reduction in the, the misuse of opioids by teenagers. So as a result of that, we were not very concerned that they were dying from overdoses. But this seems to be shifting. And I think that it's actually crucial that we become aware of it. And so this data actually shows a phenomenon that cannot capture my attention until very recently, because as everyone else, I was just guiding myself. No, they are not at risk. They are not consuming opioids. But look at overdose mortality in individuals that are 15 to 19 years of age from fentanyl. Fentanyl involved overdose deaths. This is it in blue, almost non-existent. And then starting in 2016 with the rest of the United States, you start to see the increase. And look at this steep climb in 2019, just before the COVID pandemic. And then the COVID, COVID pandemic, it hasn't continued to rise as fast, but it's still rising. And now we, where we were for point, uh, point I guess, sort of less than 0.1, we're now close to 1.7. Uh, overdose deaths per 100,000 of the population with fentanyl deaths. Whereas in other deaths, they are very, very low as they have always been. So why do I bring this up? And why do I introduce by the sense that we were not concerned about it? We were not concerned about it, yes, because they know the rates of opioid seeking is very low. But what we had seen with the expansion of fentanyl in the illicit market is more and more the drug dealers are uh, contaminating all sorts of drugs, lacing them with fentanyl. And among the most frequently contaminated drugs are illicit pres prescription drugs, whether they are benzodiazepines, whether they are stimulant drugs like Adderall, or whether they are Vicodin opioid medications. They are, they, they, the, the, the percentage of them that is contaminated with fentanyl has been estimated to be at least 70%, of which 30% of the total contain doses that are sufficient to produce an overdose. There's also been reports, and actually this uh, happened last year, in New Jersey of marijuana 
that had been contaminated with fentanyl. And to the extent that we start to see drugs that are used by teenagers, that are favored by teenagers, that are usually not associated with high risk of overdoses, mixed with fentanyl, unbeknownst to them, we're going to start to see an increase in the overdoses as we're currently observing. And as we look at it and say, what shall we do? I think it behooves us to understand that we need to address as a priority prevention interventions to protect children and adolescents in such a way that they can develop in ways that drugs are not an appealing escape for circumstances that were otherwise would be too painful. And with that, I want to thank you for my attention and I will leave the microphone to Dr. Curtis. Thanks very much. Nora. Let me go to my slides. Just give that a second. Uh, can you, everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Yes. Great. Well, again, thank you very much, Nora. Um, I'd like to discuss some of my research. And as we said, it's, it's dealing with adult, adults. And I'll be talking about using digital phenotype, mainly focusing on social media language at the community level and also the individual level. Specifically, I'd like to discuss how we can use this digital phenotyping to better understand substance use disorder outcomes, measure environment and social interactions, and gain a better insight. One of the things with, for example, social media language is that you get that language from when they opened their account, which a lot of times is, you know, when they're 13, 14, up, up through adulthood. It's a historic view of them. And then I'd also like to talk about how we can use this knowledge that we develop to develop innovative approaches to promote recovery. I have no financial uh, disclosures to make. And the main learning objective today will be to identify ways that digital phenotyping is being used in addiction medicine. Behavior, including language, plays a pivotal role in the identification and treatment of substance use disorder, especially in understanding and predicting uh, relapse risk. Nearly 45 years ago, Alan Martlett obtained qualitative information from patients in treatment regarding their pri the primary situations that led them to relapse during the first 90 days following inpatient treatment. On the basis of these responses, he proposed a cognitive behavioral model of the relapse process that is shown here. It centers around a high-risk situation and the individual's response to that situation. If the individual lacks an effective coping response or the confidence to deal with the situation, we also call that low self-efficacy, the tendency is to give in to the temptation to relapse or have a lapse. The decision to use or not use is then mediated by the individual's outcome expectancies or the initial effects of using that substance. Traditionally, we have relied on theoretical models such as this to understand and to predict the initiation of substance use, to understand and predict relapse, and to have an idea about treatment outcomes, who's going to do better and who's going to do worse in treatment. In addition, considerable efforts have gone into establishing discrete diagnostic categories to guide substance use identification and treatment. Again, the majority of these efforts have been theory driven, but also many have been driven by clinical observation. And we, unfortunately, clinical observations are subject to interpretation. While theory and clinical observations are extremely important, we also need data-driven approaches to better account for the dynamic, heterogeneous, and subjective experience of substance use and approaches that integrate the social and environmental factors that influence substance use. Not only do we need to reconceptualize relapse and treatment outcomes as a multidimensional complex system, we also need to collect data that's dynamic and includes the interpersonal relationships between the distal risk factors, things such as social support, uh, environment, as well as cognitive processes such as efficacy and craving, 
uh, coping behaviors, things such as self-regulation and distraction, and also the, the environment that the person is within. We do very poor job of measuring the environment and childhood experiences and past, past experiences. In our research and in our clinical work, we have observed seemingly insignificant changes in levels of risk. Things like a slight decrease in mood ratings or changes in sentiment of a person's language. These things can kindle, can increase the likelihood of a relapse episode, often which are initiated with a minor cue. For example, increased risk may trigger a high risk situation in which a slight reduction in coping efficacy greatly increases the likelihood of a person using an ineffective coping response, thereby increasing the probability of a relapse. I believe we can do a lot. We can get a lot of this information from the data that we leave in our digital fingerprints. These are the things that we leave, it's like little trinkets of information that we leave behind when we are alive. Digital phenotyping is this moment by moment quantification of the individual level phenotype using data from personal digital devices in our online activity. My hope, my lab's hope, is to maximize the potential of this data that is automatically generated, is aggregated by our smartphones and wearable devices and our online activity. We leave these fingerprints and we can use this to measure human behavior and to provide accurate proxies for health status. Today, these data streams include sensor measurements, activity logs, and user-generated content, such as artificial intelligence-based digital phenotype derived from social media language patterns. I'm sure we can all agree that one probably makes more typing errors when they have had too many glasses of wine. Are that from our text messages, you can tell how we're doing that day. You can tell if we're having a good day or a bad day, not only by us saying it in our text message, by the tone that we use, by the word choices that we have. I propose that this data, these, this type of data, can help us address many of the limitations of traditional substance use treatments. The difficulties in retaining clients in client and clinic-based treatments are mainly because of the heterogeneity in client response to treatment. And that retention is largely due to the limited menu of available resources, especially for non-responders. Information on risk is obtained typically only during treatment sessions, many times only at treatment intake. And there's very little information obtained between sessions. There's a lot of time between sessions. Counselor availability is limited. And finally, treatment is not personalized. How can technology help? How can we use big data? How can we use artificial intelligence, deep learning, all of these things? How can we use information from our digital phenotype derived from things like social media pattern, data from smartphone sensors, how can we use that to help us improve treatment for substance use disorder? Let's look at that smartphone that you keep with you most times of the day and you take with you everywhere you go. Well, we can directly ask you through that device about your mood, about your social support. Are you feeling connected? Are you happy or are you sad? What are you doing? Where did you go? We can also collect self-report information via your substance use. We can ask you about your substance use. We can ask you about your sleep. We can ask you about your diet. We can ask you about tons of things that can come across immediately to you in the moment on your social, on your, on your smartphone. But that innocent little device that you have next to you has over 15 sensors. It actually has more than that by now. And we are currently collecting <laughs> data from with your permission, of course. For example, we can collect ambient sound. We can collect the ambient noise. And we can record that, for example, for noisy or silent moments. We can show an average of the sound levels throughout the day. We can do that for your, for your movement. Are you moving more today than you did yesterday? How many steps did you take? 
We can look at your location. Where did you go? And that location information can be tagged, for example, uh, was it, you know, was it a drugstore? Was it a high risk area? Was it, you know, a doctor's office? Now for going back to example of the, like the sound data, while we don't collect the actual sound, there's some privacy issues with, you know, just turning on mics and doing that, you know, we need to abide by the law, but we cannot, but when we do that and we collect sound, we don't actually collect the sound, we're collecting sound levels. So there are ways that we can use data that respect the privacy of our participants as well as abide by the law. Now the sensor data allows us to extrapolate many things. We can extrapolate physical movement. We can extrapolate social interaction. We can extrapolate things that's going on in your daily life. Many things to extrapolate and you know, behaviors that's going on. For example, from keystroke data uh, and the content that you post on social media sites, we can do a sentiment analysis of the language you type on your phone and the language you post online. We get overall sentiment scores on a conversation se session. But we can also look at the specific language that you're using, such as communication related to recovery and relapse, what you're typing, what you're posting online, what you're posting and typing and texting to friends. These digital phenotype data, first of all, for 24-7, well, I mean, hopefully you aren't using your phone 24-7, but as long as you're on your phone or as long as you're posting on social media, as long as you're connected to a device, that information is being collected and stored about you. It's also collected passively. And when I say that, that means that it's collected without the individual doing anything over and above what they were already doing on their device. It is user generated and it's collected in real time. While we may get the data at year you know, 2022, the data can cover a person's lifespan for the last 10 or 20 years. We can also process large amounts of data from various sources over that person's course of life. This reduces the idea of recall bias. We can gain insights into patients' lives that we have not traditionally been able to have access to. The desire to capture the, these digital phenotypes have spanned many mental health conditions, and just a few of them are here. The last decade has witnessed a steady increase of digital phenotype studies related to mental health. However, as you can see, advantages of this disinformation technology is not widely adopted in substance use disorder research or treatment. Let's now discuss several innovative approaches to integrating digital phenotype into understanding substance use trends and predicting treatment outcomes. I'd like to first talk about online surveillance using looking at excessive alcohol consumption across the U.S. It's deadly. It could have, we have over 88,000 deaths a year. It costs over 250 billion annually. And the question of how to best measure alcohol consumption patterns and excessive alcohol consumption dates back to the 1920s. One challenge in measuring excessive alcohol consumption is the difficulty in gathering survey data, which is traditionally relied on national phone surveys and eventually moved to you know, email. But these surveys are costly, time consuming, and susceptible to patient recall bias, social desirability of responding, and potentially unintentional bias of the person who's asking the question. In my lab, we're developing ways to track excessive alcohol consumption across the US using digital phenotype. We're also doing this with opiate overdoses and other drugs. This can help policymakers in allocating resources and can help public health officials to identify communities to target for health messaging. In this study, we examine the feasibility of using Twitter to monitor binge drinking with a focus on the regional and cultural differences. Specifically, we address the following questions. Do Twitter messages expressing language, 
indicating excessive alcohol use correlate with county level alcohol consumption rates. So here we're using the county as the level of analysis. We also wanted to know what are the content of these binge drinking related tweets. We wanted to know what insights can we gain from examining the regional and cultural variations in the language of these tweets. And finally, can linguistic features, things like pronoun use, sentiment, valence, positive, negative, help us to understand and characterize the content of these alcohol, excessive alcohol tweets within communities. Our aim was to examine the efficacy of social media language, digital phenotyping as an emerging tool for public health monitoring and potential intervention development. Okay, this is a fancy slide to show you kind of how we do this. So we take the data at a county level, which is Twitter, tweet, tweet, and we process that. So let me go through and tell you a little bit, walk you through how we do this. We collect a random sample, typically one to 10% of Twitter data, their tweets, and we have the location information and we map that to specific counties in the United States. Next, several steps were taken to extract features. These are the independent variables from the county tweet data and we split tweets into words, capturing typical language and social media specific language, things like emoticons, hearts, as well as hashtags. And those things like hashtag tweet, and those become words. Word frequencies are summed at the county level and used to find relative frequencies of groups of words. These are called topics. So we take the individual words in a tweet, those become words as well as you know, the emoticons, and then we group those together and those become topics. And then we use a probabilistic technique. On our traditional data sources, we have data, for example, from online surveys and that, I mean, not online surveys, but national surveys, things for in this example, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which is a national survey that covers the 50 states, including DC, Puerto Rico, and Guam, and the US Virgin Islands. From here, we can obtain county level measures of excessive drinking, things like binge drinking, as well as heavy drinking. Demographic data can, comes from the US Census Bureau and the American Community Survey. And we also use designations from the American Communities Project. This, is, this was in addition to our county and state level analysis. We looked at 15 community types identified by the American Community Project. The American Community Project is a county level clustering based on 36, 36 demographic social economic and cultural indicators, including population density, density, income, race, religious affiliation, education, things like that. It was developed by the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. And here are sample, sample communities include, for example, include things like big cities, college towns, Hispanic centers, rural middle America. Note that this County clustering does not depend on proximity to each other. For example, big city clusters would include um, large US cities. For example, metropolitan areas like Los Angeles and Philadelphia. We believe that this clustering scheme gives more culturally coherent interpretation of uh, expressions of drinking on alcohol and media, I mean, alcohol and uh, consumption. to the research question. We wanted to know, does Twitter messages expressing excessive alcohol consumption correlate at the county and the uh, state level? And the answer is yes. The frequency with which people tweet about excessive drinking as a percentage of all their tweets is moderately correlated with excessive drinking at both the county and the state level. Next, we ask, what are the contents of these binge drinking related tweets? 
what do they contain? What type of language? The drunk topics most associated with high levels of excessive drinking at the county level included things like hashtags related to drinking and partying and friends. We had tweets related to drinking with family, as well as DUI related tweets, as well as topics mentioning uh, harming self, like you know, falling asleep and uh, while drunk uh, and falling downstairs. Across the 14 counties uh, that deter, you know, used by the American Communities Project, we observed a re relationship between excessive drinking rates uh, and drunk treat frequency with trending, pref with trending significance. Based on the ACP classification, on the one hand, we observed that areas with stronger religious identifications, and those are circled in blue, as well as African-American South, were both the lowest in excessive drinking and in drunk tweeting. On the other hand, we observed that college towns were near the top in excessive drinking and were distinguished from all other community categories of communities by their extent to which they tweet about drinking. After college towns, and those are uh, in red, after college towns, rural middle America and middle suburbs tweeting, uh, tweeted the most about drinking. And those two communities, rural middle America and middle suburbs were predominantly white and of uh, lower SES. Next, we ask about the insights that we can gain from examining social media language and cultural variations of tweeting. And just briefly to talk about this in terms of the American Communities Project, this figure represents four groups, the African-American South, college towns, Hispanic centers, and evangelical hubs. These particular communities were selected related topics, and these communities and topics provide African-American communities talked about drinking at nightclubs. College towns discussed drinking on weekends and drinking humors, as well as sex-related topics. Hispanic centers, the context was more in the foreground, talking about my dad, my mom, my cousin drinking. And evangelical hubs, particularly terms reference things like being drinking, like being buzzed, but also reference sobriety, as well as responsibility, taking care of dealing with my kids. The can linguistic features such as pronoun use and valence help us to characterize drunk content within communities? And again, the answer is yes. Here we can see the use, we looked at impersonal and personal nature of tweeting related to drinking and perceived in, in counties across the county. This figure shows how personal natures of tweeting about drinking measure as a relative frequency of pronoun use relates to the sentiment of the tweet. We generally observed that positive tweets about drinking tended to be more impersonal and referenced more general practices and cultural norms, more so thinking about oneself or other. This is particularly true in college towns. Inversely, tweets containing personal pronouns tended to be more negative in valence with Hispanic centers sharing by far the most personal content. In summary, we found that Twitter, a type of digital phenotype, can be used as a lens into regional and community contexts to understand excessive alcohol consumption. Next, I'd like to move to the clinic and to tell you about a study that we used where we collected social media language from outpatients who were attending outpatient substance use treatment. And here, we're going to develop a risk tool that's going to be used to predict clinical outcomes. So the design of this study is pretty simple. The person comes into treatment and at baseline, we collect their social media language before entering treatment, so two years before entering treatment. We also give them a standardized um, addiction severity test uh, interview, which is take, typically takes about 45 minutes. We give them that. And we are going to use that information from the addiction severity index and the, two, the social media language two years before to predict treatment outcomes if a person is going to relapse, abstain, drop out of treatment, out to 90 days. 
There we go. To provide context for you to understand this curve, 50 is pure chance, and 100 would indicate pure accuracy. Predictions of 90-day treatment outcomes from the digital phenotype, so that's from social media language, was greater than for the ASI. That is, relapse and dropout could be predicted substantially better from analyzing someone's social media posts before entering treatment than from the addiction severity index, which is one of the gold standards um, for uh, assessment at substance use. This suggests knowing that the digital phenotype at treatment intake can aid above and beyond knowing the ASI. And here is the deep language that we use across the scores of relapse, dropout, and absence. And as you can see, that the three groups are very different. We can differentiate abstinence, relapse, and, um, and dropout. However, you'll notice that sometimes relapse look more like abstinence, and sometimes relapse look more like dropout. And this right here was collaborated. When we decided to try to break out this, we wanted to know how we were doing predicting abstinence, relapse, and dropout individually. And as we can, you can see here, we're doing a great job predicting abstinence and relapse, remembering 0.5 is chance and one is complete prediction, but we're doing the worst job predicting relapse. In additional analysis, we decided to look, think about the concept of relapse and dropout. And if you think about it from a clinical point of view, relapse, this is a chronic condition. Relapse isn't the, the best outcome. Staying in treatment is, so dropout is the best outcome. So we categorize groups, instead of doing the three, we categorize them by the four. So we have relapse in, relapse out, dropout, and, uh, and abstinence. When you typically add a variable, a fourth variable prediction, you typically have lower accuracy. But that's not true unless if the demarcation is correct. And as you can see here, predicting the four outcome was much better at predicting the, um, the three outcome. So having relapse in versus relapse out was a much better way of doing this. And so we decided to go with that. Now, what can we do with this information? This is the, this is the meat of my story. What can we do with this information? How does this translate to a clinical application? Well, we can construct a dropout risk score using these digital phenotype data. Remember, when we collect our social media data, you just really click a button. You say, yes, you can have my social media data. You log in, you agree, and we collect your social media data. It's done in five minutes, less than five, actually. Now, the ASI takes about an hour with a trained interviewer. But we know treatment centers are not going to give up the ASI, which is the most widely used tool, um, any day. So we decided to simulate what a clinic could do at baseline. So they would have the, the social media language, the digital phenotype social media language, and they would have the ASI scores. And they also have demographic variables. That's all information that they would have intake. Now we can look at probability risk scores you know, defining someone from a high risk to a low risk. We are then able to label each participant with a high risk or a low risk score and predict out 90 days. And as you can see, we, we, we are only again using the two years of social media language beforehand. And as you can see, we are doing a pretty good job with three, the four different risk scores of predicting out who's likely to drop out of treatment and who's likely to stay in. We can examine this pretreatment risk separation directly by considering the proportion of our participants who remained in treatment broken into the four quartiles of strata that we had, remember, using the pretreatment data. By 30 days, there's a large separation between risk quartiles is established, and on average, the quartiles continue to separate going into 60 and 90 days. Where the validity of the risk score can be examined based on its ability to distinguish these four treatment outcomes at 30, 60, and 90 days. 
In the plot here, nearly all individuals who ended up in the relapse in category were identified as low risk using only pre-treatment data, social media language, as well as the, uh, the ASI and the uh, demographics. While most individuals ending up in the relapse out category by 90 days have been identified as high risk. This analysis simulated risk scores that could have been done when a patient entered treatment, just using their social media language, the ASI that they were already given, as well as the basic demographic questions. So one of the things that we like to say that is a joke and everyone knows is I say words matter. And the digital phenotype extracted from social media language combined with these standard intake measures could have been used to determine who was most at risk of dropout and who was least at risk. And then information and tailored and treatment could have been tailored and customized to that participant. I'd like to thank everyone today for, for listening to my talk. I'd like to thank my lab. I have an amazing group of labs, Go Team TTRU, who um, a diverse group of psychologists to computer scientists who have helped me with my research. I have an amazing list of collaborators I'd like to thank. And of course, I have to thank my scientific director, Amy, and I have to thank Nora. All right, well, Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for very stimulating uh, uh, presentations. And the stimulation has resulted in a small flood of questions covering a considerable range. So uh, what I'll do is uh, present some of these questions and either in your uh, area indicate, or you can discuss it between the two of you. President Biden, in his State of Union address, stated a goal of ending opioid epidemic. Can you uh, sort of very briefly summarize what is the proposed government program and the role of NIDA? in this uh, uh, ambitious undertaking. Yeah, no, and I applaud him for that. And, and the strategy, which is led by HHS, uh, engages the importance of enhancing prevention, enhancing treatment, enhancing research, providing actually resources for data gathering, and for the first time also addressing the importance of um, harm reduction strategies. So it's a very integrative effort um, that, that links not just the treatment and, and, and a need of harm reduction interventions, but addresses the importance of prevention and addresses the importance on, uh, as I say, of research. It does not specifically aim to go after a particular drug. It is now recognized that we cannot limit it to prescription opioids. Yes, that's how it started. So addressing pain needs is crucial, but it's not sufficient. It's clearly not sufficient. And as I ended up my slide today, I mean, teenagers where you've seen a five-fold increase in overdose deaths from fentanyl uh, over a sort of 15-year period, a five-fold increase, that's unlikely to go down. And that does reflect the shifting market um, from, from fentanyl contamination of all types of drugs. So recognizing prevention is uh, a key component. So what, what programs do we currently have that address uh, trying to control fentanyl? Uh, I, I gather they don't seem to be very effective, but what, what, what are we doing and what do you think might be done? Well, the, the agency that's in charge of uh, the oversight for control of drugs coming into the country is, is the Office of the National Drug Control Policy, which provides the oversight and the DEA, which also provides resources to try to minimize entry of these very dangerous drugs. All along, there's been these whole discussions of demand supply 
uh, which one is more important. And the fact is both of them are crucially important. I mean, obviously supply, just addressing supply is not sufficient because if you can, for example, get completely rid of fentanyl right now, and people are still addicted to these drugs, they're going to be seeking out alternatives. So you need to address both that supply and that demand. And, um, and we as an agency, uh, NIH and on research, we have basically been just working on the area of the demand, uh, addressing uh, evidence, developing evidence-based interventions that will prevent the demand for these drugs. And if you are already exposed to them and need them because you're addicted, then to address their treatment. Whereas we have done very, very little in terms of the, um, the supply. And, and yet it seems to me as I was listening to Dr. Curtis that that we as an agency in terms of science, there is also extraordinary opportunities to help us um, in, the, in, in, in the enterprise of con containing that supply. And, and for example, to the extent that through these tweets, you can help characterize new emerging drugs that are actually happening that otherwise are not going to be recognized because we don't have that the tools, the, the laboratory tools to determine if they are present in urine or not. But through the tweets, uh, I bet you we can very rapidly start to identify new drugs as they emerge in community and what the dialogue is through them. And I, I do not know, Brenda, have you uh, gotten in any way engaged to try to help us identify the emerging new drug threats? Yes, actually one of my, a paper I did a while ago, uh, and we, we still are watching this, is that we look at the emerging drugs of synthetic marijuana and the bath salts. And we looked at how they were uh, being, you know, traveled online, uh, the, the interest by state, by county. So yes, we did that. That's the same type of like surveillance that we do with not only what are they searching, where do they go when they search? So where do they land? So when they search, are they getting a public health message that I'd like for them to get? Or are they getting where they can buy it and how to use it and those types of questions? But yeah, so that, I think that, it's powerful. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I think it's a very, very powerful tool because right now, uh, we, and I didn't get into any of the details because of time, we get data. I mean, I know what the overdose deaths were seven months ago. I don't know right now what the overdose deaths are because it takes six to seven months to get that data. And there's no reason why we cannot employ other tools like the one that Dr. Curtis was discussing or some of the tools that we have already developed prior to COVID like the, the SUASH monitoring of drugs, which is now used as a monitoring device for new variants of COVID, we could use it as a monitoring system to determine the extent to which communities are being exposed to synthetic drugs and what type of drug. And it would be really interesting to see what is the correlation between the exposures that you're obtaining with the sewage system and the uh, social media mentions, and of course the overdose deaths in those areas. So there we could play a more important role in getting more timely data uh, when if we it we brought these techniques to bear. So uh, that brings up uh, another question that's uh, been asked. Uh, when marijuana was legalized, I remember you, Nora, and others to discuss, discuss considerable concern uh, about the possible effects of marijuana on the developing brain, particularly with its high consumption by adolescents and maybe even young children, I don't know. Uh, do we, is there data or observations as to whether that is a uh, realistic fear or is it something that is still being worked on intensively? What's the status of that concern? We, um, we know all along that smoking marijuana by teenagers results to a much higher risk of school dropout. And for those that don't uh, actually drop out of school, their, their educational attainment is much lower, much worse uh, grades, worse cognitive performance. And as they grow into adulthood, uh, 
they are less likely to have uh, jobs where they uh, have higher higher incomes and where they are satisfied satisfied with them. So unequivocally, we know that the use of marijuana by teenagers, particularly the most frequent regular use, is associated with negative outcomes. There, that, that is not an issue that we're questioning. What people have been questioning, and this is again a valid point, and why we actually launched the ABCD starting at age nine to 10, as opposed to infancy, because we knew that infancy was very important, because there was an urgent need to try to get data rapidly to address that question that people have been actually asking. How do you know that kids that are going to drop out of school were already not having an underlying disadvantage that led them to smoke marijuana and that disadvantage led them to drop out of school. But there's not a causal association with the marijuana taking and the dropout. And in order to be able to address the notion of causality, we started at age nine to 10 on ABCD because at that stage, basically none of the children has been exposed to marijuana. But we have a very in-depth characterization of their cognitive performance and of their brain. So we are monitoring their trajectories as they transition into uh, young adulthood, and we're monitoring their exposures to drugs. So we can determine is that drop out of school, the poor performance, their use of marijuana, and underlying vulnerability factors that accounts for all of them, or is there a causal linkage for the use of marijuana into these changes in the brain? There are reports out there in the literature that actually are quite credible that do seem to indicate that exposure to regular marijuana interferes with brain development and that is not just something that preceded the use of these substances. But um, then there are other studies that have shown no evidence that to be the case. The other aspect why this is very important is not just about cognitive performance. For many years, there's been a lot of work trying to understand if the use of marijuana is a contributing factor to mental illness. And in particular, there is a lot of concern that it may contribute to schizophrenia and psychosis. And we do know that smoking marijuana with high content THC can trigger psychosis almost on any one of us if the dose is sufficiently high. And in some that may be vulnerable, that may transition into chronic psychosis, a schizophrenic episode. So this, this is extremely consequential, that's one. The other area that has generated a lot, a lot of interest, because you cannot just ignore the, the epidemiological data, is there, there is an association with frequent use of marijuana and suicidal behavior among teenagers. And this uh, increase in suicidal behavior does not appear to be associated per se with depression, which is what leads to the main cause of suicide, but it may be associated with more impulsive type of suicide. So in addition to uh, the potential deleterious effects of marijuana on cognition and school performance, there is the concern that the use of marijuana may in fact increase your risk for a very adverse mental health consequences. And the ABCD study was power to be able to help us address whether there in fact there is evidence of causality. Uh, are there data where that, for example, compare uh, states which early on uh, legalized marijuana uh, as compared to the others, or at least, you know, in terms of issues of uh, children and schooling and addiction and, you know, the whole, the whole picture? Is that a, a valid? comparison to be made between those two different types of state policies? Oh, oh, yes, and there's been a lot, a lot of research. And when you were asking, I was just having this big smile because the, the, the reports have been in all directions. Initially, there was one study that came up and say the legalization of marijuana by the states is associated with a reduction in overdose deaths from opioids. And then, of course, that didn't pan out. And then there was another paper that just got re uh, retracted from JAMA Network that showed that uh, actually
Um, so hey, Brenda, several people have asked how you deal with the issue really of uh, privacy and uh, both the kinds of studies that you have done, are doing, and particularly those more expansive ones that one thinks of in the future. Uh, if privacy is an issue and many people refuse to participate, how does that influence your algorithm and uh, analysis? So as we do the, you know, the you use algorithms, you want to make sure your algorithms aren't biased. Your alg algorithms can be biased based on the bias data going in. If you only get certain types of people going in, your algorithms are only going to predict based on those people. So I do I actually do a lot of ethics work. And one of the things we have to remember is that consent is a process. Um, we have we are up very upfront with our participants about what we're collecting. The app that we developed to, uh, along with others, to collect this, people can turn on and off what they want us to collect. We, so they have choice. They have we have a serious consenting process. We have videos. We explain to them the data we collect, how it comes to us, the point that is aggregated, and we're not getting, for example, that they talk to Mike and what they said. We just know that this random code and what the text, what the letters were. So we do explain to people and we have a really good, we just finished, uh, I didn't talk about it today, but we just finished a COVID study where we had, uh, well, it was during COVID where we had over 2,500 people who consented to be in the study and we followed them for like over 150 days. And uh, we did a subsample of 300 we asked everyone if they want to be part of the 300, and they all say yes. The 300 is the group that they put the digital phenotype app on their phone and track them for 30 days, everything that they did. Their social media language, their text messages, everything, their location, their movement, all of the sensor data. And I think that we have been successful because of our consenting process as well as um, you know, just kind of how we do it. And we let them know why we're doing it and what the type of information we're going to get. So we do get consent when we're doing our sensor-based study. For our Facebook study, of course we get consent that is a private uh, entity that you have to get consent to download the data. But however, for the Twitter and the Reddit data, that's a public data source that anyone can go there and download the data and we do that. But we actually take other precautions. We never post a tweet. Like for example, I'll talk about counties with higher levels of excessive drinking. So you'll never see me pull out a tweet that was like deemed a high level of excessive drinking or one where people are talking about recovery or substance use. So we do our best to be to respect people and respect uh, the study and the data. Are you concerned about this as a uh, investigative tool uh, so yes. Um, <laughs> in terms of not just your standards, well, but it's going to be widely used if, if it becomes available. How, well, what are, you, are you concerned about that? Yeah, um, I gave a talk and I was so excited about this. And someone pointed out that, you know, treatment centers, some of them get paid by their outcomes and that it is possible a treatment center could use this to take the people that were in that low risk group. So not taking the high risk group. Um, whenever we have a new technology or a new methodology, many times it can be used for good or it can be used for bad. I still have to do the research and I do my best to work with partners who are going to use it for good. Um, but yes, those are concerns. You know, we, we're very cautious of what we post, our code and who we collaborate with. But yes, some things could be used for bad. So we have a couple of questions. We'll follow up on this here. One is, um, do poor people uh, have smartphones? So, you know, this right here data actually comes from my first R01 that uh, I got from NIDA, or that, you know, NIDA funded. And what we did, the first thing that we did was we went into inner city communities, poor Medicaid-assisted treatment facilities, and we did a survey. We surveyed everyone that, you know, there we did hundreds of people and we found out about their smartphones, their cell phone use, what type of plans, how they access the internet, where they went online, did they use social media? And guess what? They use their phone just like we do. They go to the same sites we go to, they use social media at the same rates, 
I mean, it's hard to not have a cell phone right now. Now, the population that we don't get are like the homeless population. I have not been able to do research with them. But people who, you know, are kind of going through the day. Now, the other thing was during that time, there were government, uh, like, brick phones. There were phones that were given. Um, they used to call them the Obama phones. So people did have phones. Now, people shared phones. So there are some issues with that because a lot of, like, three people in a family or three adults will share a phone. And people may not, all, and then people have pay-as-you-go phones. So they may have funds in the beginning of the month or their cycle, but not at the end. So you have to be very cautious as you develop interventions, thinking about data plans and the plans that people are sharing phones. But they were at the same rate as everyone else in the, the general population. So someone asks whether, it, well, it raises the question of whether smartphone addiction is smartphone use in adolescence an addiction? And if not, is it becoming one? Or, I mean, granted, uh, we're yeah. talking with the words a little bit, but uh, are you? how does that influence uh, uh, the type of study that you do? Working with adults, but you, you, you point to something, and I'm going to punt this to Nora too, uh, Dr. Volkoff, but one of the things is that um, it's cell phone addiction and internet addiction is currently not recognized as an addictive uh, thing. Um, yeah, uh, Nora, I'm going to punt that to you now. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's a, a very important question because we're seeing more and more teenagers spending time right. in social media, and there's all of this concern that the social media algorithms are being developed to maximize the likelihood that you get engaged with them and it results in compulsive behaviors. And we know that that can lead to adverse consequences in teenagers and others, also adults. The ICD-11 does recognize addiction to um, so, uh, social media that we don't recognize on the DSM-5. So the European classification does recognize non-drug addictions that can result in behavioral patterns that are detrimental and should be treated. The uh, DSM-5 recognizes gambling disorder uh, is the only non-drug addiction or behavioral addiction that is recognized by them, though they basically very explicitly stipulate that when there's more evidence, they will consider this other one. Uh, in the meantime, though, it, uh, I don't think that we can continue to ignore uh, the whole notion of unregulated social media because uh, it's, it's already resulting in patterns that are very deleterious to mental health, particularly on teenagers. And if it is unregulated, there's again, it's just like the illicit drug market. I mean, you go, your incentive is to make the most amount of money without caring for the consequences. In the ABCD study, we have been monitoring the utilization of social media, and it clearly shows that not all of the social media is negative that screen time can have deleterious consequences. For example, when it is associated with more, most passive uh, viewing like video gaming and gambling type activities. Whereas when it relates and gives the opportunity of teenagers to create uh, networks, then it can have positive effects. So, so it's not like it's bad per se, but it's understanding under what conditions it can be positive and understanding when it can be negative. And, and importantly, being able to identify when the pattern becomes compulsive. And I was going to throw it back to Brenda because she has the tools to directly determine the time someone spends uh, on responding, the time that actually uh, the engagement, the diversity of the activities, the variability, how those that intrude, for example, into sleep hours. I bet you that it's, I mean, you are using the tool that is responsible for the compulsive behavior to capture it. Yes, and that, that, yeah, that is all true. So one of the things that we talk about is the media diet. And when we have the, that app I talk about on your phone, we get all of that information, the screen time, if, you know, how, how hard you press on your phone, which can indicate anxiety, uh, the keystrokes, like what you type, but we also can look at your sleep patterns, you know, was your phone on, were you posting on social media, so were you using a different device maybe? We get uh, the light sensor in your phone, tell us if the lights are on and off, we have sound. So yes, we can, we get a pretty good indication about your sleep pattern and what you're doing. Now remember, while we get the sensor data, we're also getting your language data. And we have a study that 
hopefully it's going out any day now, where we're looking at your posting and kind of your mood and sentiment on your tweets and we can, and not your tweets on your, your, uh, your SMS text, as well as your social media language. So now we can look at days that you use Facebook or days that you're talking to your friends or who you're talking to, that type of day, you know, what's your mood on those days and how, how does that carry over to the, your other forms of communication and your mood and, you know, and sentiment and all those things. So yes, we have that. And one of the things that we have published, I think two papers on now, is looking at loneliness and alcohol consumption and uh, using kind of these digital phenotypes on days that you are lonelier than normal, on days that you are you know, lonely, that you just express being lonely in general. Uh, Nor, we have a question of whether there's any connection between autism and drug abuse. Not that we know, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that the use of drugs during pregnancy or before pregnancy is associated with autism. I mean, as we know, I mean, the rates of Asperger's syndrome has been going up and there's been a lot of hypotheses about what may be happening, but I don't know of any evidence that links it with either legal or illegal drugs. And you wanna comment briefly about why the Native Americans have the extraordinarily uh, high and accelerating rate uh, of drug abuse and addiction. In that, I guess, second slide that you uh, showed beginning uh, last year, they go off the map. Is, is that influenced at all as to whether the data are examined as direct data or subjected to Bayesian analysis? Or what, what is the explanation for that? No, I mean, the, it's basically in terms of the numbers when you control for density of population, they have the highest rates of mortality. And that, that number that I show you there actually is both for males and females. If you just look at males, it just goes off the roof at numbers that we don't see in any other subgroup. And it drives, uh, I mean, the vulnerability of actually the stress and long-term stress and very, very adverse conditions that people from American Indian and Alaska Native heritage suffer from. And the, it epitomizes how devastating social stressors and, and inequality and injustice. I mean, and you sort of, when you think about it, what are some of the hardest things for people to adjust to is unfairness and injustice actually generate an enormous amount of turmoil. And so, uh, and, and in the American Indian, for example, we have uh, recognized that this is one of the factors that contributes, not the only one in terms, for example, of the use of alcohol. It's also uh, among them, you have the highest rates of suicide among children. Mm -hmm. And then these extremely high rates of overdose mortality that in these communities appear to be driven very markedly by methamphetamine. So, it is we've generated uh, societies so societies of inequality. Yeah, uh, I mean, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, go ahead. You want to come? Well, no, I mean, one of like, as Nora said, like, there isn't anything specific about one race or another with substance use. Like, when we look at race variables, what we're looking at are social constructs, and yeah. we're looking at you know systematic racism that has been perpetuated for years and the stress and the turmoil, the trauma, the toxic stress that is happening. It's not that there's something specific about one's ethnicity that causes substance use. Well, uh, yes, it's complicated. <laughs> um, let's see, we have time for a couple of more questions. Let me, uh, ah, yes, here's one for you, Brenda. Uh, at one point, uh, does it you, does passive monitoring such as what you're doing? How do you know when to draw the line and introduce what you might call active monitoring? I mean, how how do you know from all this massive information that somebody, an individual, is at risk? And I. I, I are there any yardsticks for that, or is that the sort of thing that you're studying? So remember, when I'm getting the data, I'm analyzing it six months, three months after collecting it. 
I currently am not doing, we, someone on my lab is starting to look, or not starting at this, that's what he works at, David Epstein, um, as far as kind of this real time and when you get a real time measure, you do something about it, what, what do you do? So for me, I'm doing passive monitoring as well as, you know, I may ask a question like, how are you doing or your mood, but that information gets stored and I don't do anything with that information. Um, there is lots of ethical issues. And I think that I, I think that this should be done. Don't get me wrong. Like this is something I think has to be the next step. And hopefully the research that I'm conducting will help David and uh, doing what he's doing. I just currently, I'm not doing that right now. But I do think we have to get to that. And I've talked to participants and done surveys and asked them and also done interviews. And they want that people in recovery and in treatment, but also specifically families of people in treatment and recovery would like this information. They'd like to get up in the morning and know how their loved one is doing, knowing if their day is gonna be turned around because of something. So um, we have a lot of people that want that tool. I just Good. haven't developed well, it yet. Uh, in the last few minutes, maybe uh, you both might comment about a question that was raised here. And, and that is the apparent increasing interest uh, regarding psychedelic uh, drugs and their relationship uh, not, not to the production of, uh, of mental illness, but to the treatment of addiction. Uh, there seems to be a beginning groundswell of interest in seeing more research and studies. Do, do you want to comment about that, uh, perhaps both of you? Or? Yeah, no, and I think that uh, what has made it uh, more realistic in terms of bringing the, some of these drugs to therapeutics was the positive experience with the use of ketamine for the treatment of depression. I mean, ketamine is a drug is uh, it's a drug that has both stimulants and some somewhat hallucinogenic properties, and uh, ketamine can be quite addictive, and it's uh, the favorite drug in some countries in Africa. And yet when it's used within the medical context, it has been shown to be beneficial for the treatment of treatment resistant depression. And it has been overall quite safe in administer and in its administration. And I do not know of what cases that have reported that as a result of ketamine, they become, became addicted. It's very, very well regulated. So there's no reason why, we, for example, we couldn't use uh, hallucinogenic drugs like psilocin, PCP, or ecstasy, or um, or LSD. I mean, like anything else, what happens is we tend to have these pendulums. People, people actually say, this is the panacea. It's going to solve everything. Like what has happened, marijuana. Marijuana is a miracle drug of miracle drugs. It cures everything, cancer, Alzheimer's, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think that we need to um, be uh, careful that that hype does not go out of proportion because there, then you generate an expectation that's of course unlikely to be funded. Yet at the same time, it is possible that there are some indications where it applied in, in, in a well done context, you can have interesting results. And there's data out there, for example, that has shown it be, being beneficial for the treatment of depressive episodes in patients with terminal illnesses, where the administration of these drugs can actually improve the way and their acceptance of the disease process through which they are going on. There's also a lot of interest for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And we've also funded researchers to investigate its potential the benefit for treatment of addiction. So, but these are very early stages in the whole the, um, scientific knowledge of what, how to use it, what doses, for whom, and what is it that we should be expecting. The aspect about uh, psychedelic drugs too is it's uh, uh, forcing us to see treatments in a different way from the way that we've given them. So if I give you an antidepressant and I send you home, you take your drug at home on a daily basis. In this case, the psychedelic drugs are basically given with two people that are guiding you through the journey. And it is their intervention that uh, jointly with the drug itself that's going to be therapeutic and the effect is going to be almost like a domino effect. It's not something that you're going to be taking daily. You may need two or three sessions separated for a certain period of time and, and then constructed that way. So it's, it's a very different 
perspective of uh, how they are going to be delivering it for, for benefit. But research will say, and it will tell us uh, where the promises are. And, and I hope that the hype does not go out of proportion. And the other issue that I'm very concerned is when you have drugs that have medical potential, there's a lot of media attention and that generates a lot of curiosity. So for example, last year among uh, college uh, young people, there was a, almost a doubling on the number of them that consume an hallucinogenic drug. And, and it is likely to reflect the a massive attention from the media, but also I think if you are with a, with a COVID pandemic and we're all isolated and we're looking for experiences, well, hallucinogenic drugs may have seemed like a way a way, a way to escape, but we have to be very cautious that this does not result in negative consequences to someone that uses them without knowing and in, ends up with a severe psychosis. Hmm. Brenda, do you have a comment you want to make on this? Oh, no, the experts, this was great. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Well, we have uh, reached our time limit. Uh, there, are, I'm sorry, there are other questions that have been asked that we couldn't quite get to. I apologize. Uh, but thank the both of you, really, for very uh, exciting, provocative uh, presentations. And uh, welcome to NIH, Dr. Curtis. We look forward to meeting you in person. You so have meet to meet well. here are the roses. Oh, once thank again. you for the roses. <laughs> thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. We're all. Bye-bye, Brenda. Bye-bye. See you soon. <laughs>